timing for today it really couldn't be better uh, to talk about transportation. Actually, there was a fair amount of coverage about it in the Gazette yesterday in the business section. Uh, service on the new high-speed rail, rail service um, line will start in January when the Vermonter comes back to Northampton after, I think I heard, 25 years of being in Amherst. Is that possible? Wow. Um, the, and also, the Mass DOT released a five-year, $12.4 billion capital investment plan. Comments on that plan were actually due um, last Friday. There are a number of projects proposed for this area, including uh, reconstruction of the I-91 viaduct, the elevated highway there in Springfield. Um, and there's widespread support, including from the chamber, to augment the Vermonter service, which is one train a day, with an additional 10 round trips between um, Springfield and Greenfield. The idea is that this opens up the possibility for community commuter rail service to Springfield and Hartford. 1,500 people that live in or that work that are that live in Hampshire County actually travel to Connecticut for their jobs every day, and several thousand leave Hampshire County into Hampden County. So there's certainly um, a reason for good commuter service, especially with the reconstruction of the viaduct, um, which will be somewhat disruptive, I think, but well, uh, long overdue and well deserved. And then also those, that new high-speed rail service connects directly, it's a, real, it's a direct line to our visitor market, which is Metro New York and Metro Connecticut. So the convenience of additional trains will, I think, make a huge impact on a visitor's decision to, to hop on the train and come up to our area. So let's get to it. Um, Joe Wagner, I'm gonna introduce him, he is the eighth He's the representative of the 8th Hamden District that includes a good part of the city of Chicopee. He's also the House Chair on the Joint Committee on Economic Development and Emerging Technologies. Um, that committee is responsible for legislation and policy that affects economic and business development, of course, casino gaming, uh, science and technology, information, biotech, medical technologies. I mean, those are really the forefront of Massachusetts economic future. So Joe's in charge of that. Um, he also, I think, used to be chair, joint, chair of the Joint Committee on Transportation, is that right? Okay. He still is, don't tell him he is. <laughs> he still is, that's not on your profile. <laughs> that's not true, is it? It's not true, okay. That's why it wasn't on your profile, okay. I think Joe has probably got to be one of the most fun legislatures in the House, too, so I'll invite him to the podium to introduce the Secretary. Suzanne, thank you for those very uh, kind words of introduction. And uh, you both stole a little bit of my thunder because I was going to start by, by telling you all a little secret. Um, most people in Western Massachusetts and many in Boston still think, probably because I served for eight years as chair and another four as vice chair and for 16 years on the committee, most people still think I chair the Committee on Transportation. <laughs> and so I was going to ask you all to keep that little secret to yourselves and to not let the secretary know. <laughs> but the cat's out of the bag and uh, he indicated that he already knew it, but uh, that hasn't stopped him from being a very good friend uh, personally and a very good uh, uh, friend and colleague uh, for all of us here in Western Massachusetts. So let me, uh, let me just uh, uh, begin with some words of, of uh, introduction here, if I, if I may, and, and this is technology for you. I just had uh, the secretary's bio up, and it went off the screen, and a state house news article popped up. <laughs> and I'm I'm back looking for the bio, so uh, I'll read from the script for just a minute, and then I'm going to go off script for just a minute. But just just to give you uh, uh, formally a little bit about uh, your guest speaker uh, here today, and our good friend in government, uh, Secretary Davey was appointed by Governor Patrick. Uh, as the uh, Secretary and Chief Executive Officer of the Massachusetts DOT in September of 2011. He leads a 10,000 person uh, organization that operates with a single mission to provide safe, reliable, and efficient transportation and an efficient transportation system for the citizens of the Commonwealth. Uh, he and his team are implementing a strategic investment and operations plan focused on the five priority areas uh, of the governor, safety, customer service, employee engagement, fiscal responsibility, and innovation. When we said hello today, he said, uh, I said, how are you? I said, how are you doing? And he said, how am I doing? 
on each and every one of those uh, points and in each and every one of those areas, uh, you're doing very well. And more on that in just a moment. So prior to his current appointment, Secretary Davey uh, served as the MBTA General Manager uh, and MassDOT Rail and Transit Administrator, where he was responsible for managing the MBTA and overseeing the Commonwealth's 15 regional transit authorities uh, and MassDOT's rail program. We know a lot about uh, the RTAs out here in Western Massachusetts, obviously. Uh, with his energetic leadership style, he was able to uh, implement sustainable and impactful initiatives that improved operations and safety, customer service, and changed the culture uh, within the MBTA. Prior to joining MassDOT, uh, he served in a variety of capacities, including general manager uh, at the Mass Bay Commuter Railroad. Now, I'll get back to that in just one minute. Uh, that's the company that operates and maintains the MBTA's commuter rail service. In 2010, the Boston Business Journal named Secretary Davey a top 40 under 40. He took the job at age 38, and I remember uh, just prior to his appointment saying that his greatest challenge wouldn't be infrastructure and wouldn't be mass transit. It would be surviving two years and getting to the age of 40 <laughs> in that job. So he was recognized uh, for being a top 40 under 40, and in 2012, the Greater, Greater Boston uh, Chamber of Commerce named him one of the 10 outstanding young leaders in Boston. He serves on the board of directors of both the Immigrant Learning Center in Malden and the Animal uh, Rescue League in Boston, as well as the Board of Advisors uh, of Samaritans. He earned a Bachelor of Arts uh, degree from the College of the Holy Cross, the Juris Doctorate, summa cum laude from Gonzaga University School of Law. Uh, we all know Gonzaga as March Madness approaches for uh, more than just their uh, uh, fine institutions of learning, uh, schools of learning uh, within the, the, the uh, college. He proudly served as a member of the Jesuit Volunteer Corps in Hillsboro, Oregon. He and his wife live in Boston, uh, where they are regular users of the MBTA system and uh, live car free. Are you still car free? Yes, sir. Because that begs the question, how did you get out here today yeah. since, <laughs> since there, <laughs> since there, I know you didn't walk and there is no rail <laughs> yet. So back to uh, the secretary just before I bring him up uh, and his tenure with the uh, MBCR. You may know that the, the, um, the MBCR, the Mass Bay Commuter Railroad, took over for Amtrak uh, about a decade ago, uh, roughly, providing uh, MBTA service. And uh, Rich Davey was instrumental in their operations. And there was some uh, sentiment, if not a question, as to whether or not in his role as secretary and CEO at MassDOT, he could oversee a procurement process for rail service that would provide a better service delivery uh, more efficiently and at uh, better cost, with a better, within a better cost structure. And rail is very expensive and we were just having that talk. So it was thought that because of his connection to MBCR that perhaps uh, he might not be objective with respect to procurement. And I know that the secretary uh, in looking at this from a little bit of an arm's length perspective uh, was wondering whether it should be something shorter term, uh, an intermediate term contract or a longer term contract at the end of the day, and I think to the surprise of most, uh, the MBTA uh, head uh, de determined uh, to follow the recommendation of a committee which moved the contract from uh, MBCR to a new operator. So that is historic uh, here in Massachusetts with respect to rail. I think the secretary deserves a lot of credit for the way he handled the procurement and his role in that. I think it speaks to his uh, leadership ability, uh, abilities and uh, uh, to his personal qualities and characteristics. So he's been a great friend to us. I know you want to hear from him and ask some questions. Uh, my good friend, uh, the Secretary of Transportation, Rich Davey. You can take the chairman out of transportation. You can't take the transportation out of the chairman. You can see why you all do so well in Western Massachusetts, because you've got a very strong leader in Joe Wagner. Give him a round of applause, please. Now, if you don't laugh at my jokes, I'm not going to send you home. We're not going to pave the roads. You'll all be here for days. You'll have to shelter in place. Does everyone know what shelter in place means? Senator, I know you do. Um, no, first, again, to the chairman, thank you, Suzanne. Thank you very much for having me today. I sincerely appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to many of you, some for the second or third time. It's amazing you keep coming back. <laughs> it's the same jokes, you know. 
laugh. Oh, he knows. He just said he. I still laugh. Uh huh. Um, I've got a few remarks I want to share today, uh, and then frankly take questions. I saw there was uh, some tweeting going on asking for questions. I said submitted about 28 questions. <laughs> if you do have the one Tony that asks why I'm the best secretary, why I'm good looking, those are the ones that I submitted. <laughs> you could ask those anyways if you wish. Um, so a few thoughts about transportation. Obviously, as the chairman said, as Suzanne said, it has been a big issue uh, in Massachusetts. And more importantly, I think a huge issue for businesses. Because transportation, at the end of the day, is not about buses or trains as much as I might like them, or you. But it is about jobs, and it is about economic development in every corner of the state. It is what state should do at its best, which is enable the private sector to create jobs and economic development. And that's how we see ourselves. You are our main customer, our main client. And if we can't get the job done, then neither can you. And that's how we uh, are, are so focused and so much uh, on transportation in the Commonwealth. Before I talk a little bit about what I hope will happen this year, I do want to spend just a minute reflecting on what I think happened last year in transportation. You know, at MassDOT, which is now only four years old, by the way, the old Turnpike Authority, the old Highway Division, the T, the RTAs, the Registry, the old MAC Commission, all these agencies that, by the way, I think were out to get you as opposed to help you over the last 700 decades. Uh, the legislature, Joe, and I know the senator worked on this as well. Transportation reform gave birth to us back in 2009, and we are a leaner, meaner organization focused on improving your experience. Now, we still have some challenges, there's no doubt, but I can tell you now with a combined organization, we are working together. We are thinking about you and your experience integrated across all modes. And I am sincerely grateful to the governor and the legislature for giving us that opportunity. But last year, we broke ground on our, what we call our five mega projects uh, all across the state, over a billion dollars in five bridges alone. We saw improvements in on-time and on-budget delivery at the highway department, now getting to 80 and 90 percent on on-time, on-budget. Five years ago, folks, we didn't even keep those statistics, okay? They were that bad. Today, we are uh, doing better than many other departments around uh, the nation. We've made significant improvements for our customers. We set record ridership at the MBTA and at Logan Airport and saw a 10 percent increase. A million more people using PVTA between 2011 and 2012. We fought some epic storms. Does everybody remember? Three feet? Like three inches is nothing right now. Three feet, right? Um, and we rallied around the city of Boston for the region and others. I made the shelter in place uh, joke, but uh, remember, that was born out of the bar marathon bombings over a year ago, or just about a year ago. And I think, again, in conjunction with the legislature, we made a case to the public to invest in transportation. And invest we are. For the first time since 1990, we raised transportation resources for transportation. And believe you me, gas tax doesn't go to anything else except transportation. I encourage you to read the Massachusetts Constitution, which requires it to go to transportation. So we are grateful because now we are making investments in places like the Pioneer Valley, which I will talk about. That was 2013. So what do we look for in 2014? Well, I think four things we're focused on um, at the department. Forward looking. First is addressing our network capacity challenges. Has anyone sat in traffic lately? No one. No one. Let the record reflect no one raised their hand. I'll skip this. It's not thing. New Jersey. It's not New Jersey. <laughs> Indeed, it isn't. I have to say, by the way, I am thrilled that I am neither the Secretary of Transportation in New Jersey or Georgia, for that matter, uh, which has had some colossal problems in the last uh, 30 days. In any event, um, we are addressing our ongoing network challenges in two ways. First, on our highway side. I have said this, in fact, I said it in Springfield last year. We are not building any more superhighways in the state. We can't afford it. It's not the right policy from a greenhouse gas emissions. We can't, we're not going to be doing it. So we have to look at the current highway network we have today and make sure we, inf we are investing in it, that it works appropriately, and we are finding other strategies to improve capacity in our highway. What do I mean by that? Well, certainly, as mentioned earlier, one of the largest state of good repair projects, which is a nice way of saying we have something really old and it needs to be fixed, is the I-91 viaduct in downtown Springfield. $260 million has been put aside in our capital plan to address what we're calling phase one, by the way, which is to fix that portion of the viaduct over the railroad tracks, and then think long term about what the viaduct between the downtown and the Basketball Hall of Fame can be. That is an enormous, we think, not only job creator, 
but an improvement for the downtown and frankly can allow Springfield to really dream about what it should look like over the next uh, decade and beyond. Technology, if you've driven on the Mass Pike east of Worcester, you have hopefully seen these countdown signs that say seven minutes, seven miles. They never say that. Seven miles, 70 minutes. <laughs> Those are coming soon to Western Massachusetts. By the end of this year, 600 miles of road across the state will be giving you the time to your destination. But more importantly, what it gives us is real information that allows us to think about traffic, that allows us to think about your commute, that allows us to think about how we can make improvements in our roads. This is not only telling you how long you have to wait, but it is giving us actionable data at the department. I love the BZ helicopter that sort of hovers over and says, oh, there's traffic and there's traffic. That's not actionable data, folks. That is not actionable data. If you're business owners, you know what I'm talking about. In order to make changes and improvements, we need that. And that what will, that's what will happen for us. And then on the non-auto side, where we need to be improving capacity and expanding where there is improved opportunity, that will be our goal there. So what do I mean by that? We continue uh, with, for example, our complete streets philosophy, encouraging cities and towns and projects that we are convening to ensure that there are bike and pedestrian opportunities for folks to get around. We are investing over $100 million in rail alone here in the Pioneer Valley, whether it's on the Knowledge Quarter, which is, as again, previously mentioned, shifting the Vermonter service over to Springfield, to Greenville, and beyond. Uh, whether it's the improvements that we're making at Union Station, we've invested another $16 million in this capital plan to bring, I hope, Union Station back to what it was once, which was a great and beautiful train station, among other things, and bus station for that matter. And then obviously improved and new stations in places like Greenfield and Northampton. This is what we're investing in. We are investing in the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority, a new bus maintenance facility. Now, Bus maintenance facilities usually don't get people excited. See, no one got excited in here. <laughs> but if you are not investing in maintenance, things fall apart. We love new shiny things, new toys, new stations, new things to cut ribbons on. But I tell you, if you're not investing in bus engines and in locomotives and in things like bus maintenance facilities, things don't work. That is an enormous and important investment for Mary McGinnis and her staff, which we are going to be enabling as well. So that's first, improving our capacity across the state, both on the highway side and on the transit side. Two, and this continues to be something that the legislature and the governor push us on and the public does, and you should, is management excellence, both in finance and in our performance metrics. We are pushing this across the DOT, continuing to find ways to save money. We are eliminating all, are there any toll collectors here? <laughs> First of all, you should be at work. All right. you are, uh, <laughs> we are eliminating all toll collector jobs in the Commonwealth in the next two years. And that's not because toll collectors have done anything wrong. I think it's actually one of the toughest jobs in state government. But technology has caught up with our toll collectors. And that is gonna save you the taxpayer, you the toll payer actually, about $50 million per year forever once we convert to all electronic tolling. That is happening in this state. We are also moving toward outcome-based budgeting. So as opposed to just pouring money into programs, what are you expecting from us? What are we looking for for the number of structurally deficient bridges or potholes or on-time performance or wait times at the registry? What do you as a consumer expect from us? And that is what we're pushing toward. So you understand how we're spending your dollar, but more specifically, what you should expect as a consumer, whether you're waiting at the registry or you're waiting for a bus or a train. And we'll also be tying future uh, revenue and future uh, subsidies to the regional transit authorities based on ridership. Where is the ridership in the Commonwealth and what can we do to improve? The PVTA, in fact, will benefit from that. So again, working toward performance ma management and excellence, continuing to push our cost model down is something we will continue to do. I should also say one of my um, stump lines last year was that my salary uh, was paid for off the capital pro uh, bond program. In fact, much of the highway operations were funded off the state credit card, and they have been since the early 1990s. There isn't a business person in this room who would put your leases, your payroll, your benefits on, this, on your credit card. But we do in the state. We are ending that practice now 
we've begun to end that practice, again, thanks to the legislature's help, uh, and we'll have that completed by the end of next year. What does that mean? So not only does my niece and nephew, who are five and seven, won't be spending you know, their tax dollars 25 years from now on my salary today, which is exactly what's happening, but it allows us to actually use the state credit card for the kinds of projects that we need to be doing and not operations. That's important. So that was two, performance excellence and uh, budgeting. Three, using new models to deliver transportation services. I think often we have thought that the only way that transportation can be delivered is through a government entity, is through bonding, is through the normal ways that we've done in, in before. Um, and quite frankly, that's wrong. We have been looking at other ways to deliver our models. Uh, and so whether it's as simple as if you're a AAA member, being able to go to a AAA branch and get a registry transaction done, we don't have to be doing that all. Uh, to looking at, through the Private Public Partnership Commission, say that three times fast, the PPP Commission, that the legislature started two, three years ago, uh, we are looking at ways to fund other infrastructure projects with the private sector. So for example, we are seriously studying, studying building a third bridge over the Cape Cod Canal that would not have state dollars at all tied to it. Now it would be told, that's how it would be paid for, but we have to think more smartly, more creatively, and have an honest conversation about how we're gonna pay for infrastructure improvements in the future. That is a big idea, but an idea that's, I think, an exemplar of what states and we should be doing, which is thinking about how we can invest uh, in our infrastructure in different ways. And then finally, third, or excuse me, fourth, is embracing sustainability and healthy transportation. Transportation in the state is the number one uh, reason for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, no question about it. And so if we are to reduce child asthma rates, obesity, if we're to think about how we can get people moving across the state again, we have to think more creatively than just the normal way we've done business. And I think this perfect example is what we look at as we think about, as I hope you think about, beyond my term, what downtown Springfield could be with that 991 viaduct. We are looking at other neighborhoods across the state, uh, looking at taking down highway overpasses, taking them down in places like Somerville and Jamaica Plain, as opposed to building them back up. Now that is not a solution everywhere, I give you that. But if we think more creatively about the user, that we're not moving trains and buses, but we're moving people. We are moving people. And we haven't thought about that, I think, or focused on that in a long time. So embracing sustainability, embracing healthy transportation, how can we improve the user's experience across the state? Those are the four things we're focused on uh, in this coming year. Now, someone told me there's an election coming up. Oh my god. Who told me that? Chairman? You told me that, I think. Don? I think Don. Someone told me that. I forget who. Maybe they both did. Um, I have a few comments about that. First is, um, you know, we passed revenue last year, not quite as much as the administration uh, wanted, but it was a very good step uh, to invest in transportation. There is a ballot question, folks, that will be on your ballot this year that seeks to roll a portion of that back. As I stand before you today, if that ballot question passes, which is to repeal the indexing of the gas tax, what does all that mean? It means that the gas tax will go up about a half a penny a half a penny a year, it means that what I just talked about, the investments we can make, we will have to pull back on. So think about that, and I want you to think very hard about that as we talk about all the good things that we've come together. I worry about that because we will take a step back if that ballot question passes. At the federal level, at the federal level, it's even worse, and it's not because of our delegation, but the Highway Trust Fund, which has been set up to fund transportation projects across all the states in the United States is set to go bankrupt in August of this year. Huge challenges. I, as I think we all talked about earlier, and I hope you've all accepted my premise, that transportation is about jobs and economic development. Why, for the life of me, we cannot con continue to consider investing it is beyond me. I think Tip O'Neill said there's no such thing as a Democratic or Republican pothole. <laughs> They are all potholes that need to be fixed and filled. Um, and it's in that spirit that I ask you to consider to think about why government should be investing with your help in transportation. 
As I said, people want more of us, not less. I have been across the state on behalf of the governor for the better part of two and a half years in various forums, speeches, public hearings, and not one person has said to me, maybe someone today will say this to me, but not one has said, Secretary, we need less. Less buses, we shut down that road, we don't need that train service. People want more of what we are providing. And so we have to find a way to do it. Now with that said, I am also, not with the funding challenges set aside, I am excited about what the future holds for the DOT. As I said, in four years, an agency that went from all sorts of challenges, financial and otherwise, to an agency that's focused on you, our customers, improving, saving money, delivering projects more quickly, delivering projects all across the state, by the way, and not just in, in the capital city. We are focused all across. I think there's a lot of good things to look forward to. But I need your help. I need your help. I need your help to continue to remind both electeds and those who would like to be elected uh, that transportation is important, that it is a conversation that is ongoing, that the terrific step that we took with the legislature last year is not the final word on transportation. If we want train service 10 times a day to Springfield and Greenfield, I love it, but how do we pay for it? If we want to look at inland route, Springfield to Boston, I love it. We're studying it now, but we have to remember how are we going to pay for it. And so when there's a temptation, when folks say, and this will maybe my editorializing a little bit, and this is going to get me into trouble now. <laughs> when folks say you can have it all and you don't have to pay for it, please question that premise. Because I think too often in government, generally speaking, and not, but generally speaking, is that we've been misled to believe we can have it all, we don't have to pay for it. We should still, as private citizens, inquire and push government to do a better job, to manage it like a business, no doubt about it. But at the end of the day, I can tell you, the only entity that's going to make the investments in transportation is, in fact, state government. And we have to work together to make sure those investments happen. Because at the end of the day, I truly believe that my job is to help you do your jobs, which is to create jobs. And if we're not doing that together, then shame on us. With that, Tony, if you, if you want me to kick off the first question, why am I so good looking? Well, <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, no, I'm happy to uh, take questions. So thank you very much. see why I have often publicly said that this gentleman is the transparent Secretary of <laughs> Transportation. Anything and everything you're going to know, I am stunned that he is here today. Given why? The tough issues that could have come up here, like I-91. It was free it's lunch. I was coming. Free lunch. <laughs> and, and that is really intriguing. I just want to say one thing before we go right yes. to the questions. And that's related to Joe Wagner. We all know Joe locally as the state rep from Chicopee. But as a media outlet in Boston recently said, he is the most powerful member of the House, the guy that gets it done time and time again, this side of Boston, west of Boston. When there's a tough job to be done in the House, speaker after speaker has gone to Joe, and it is amazing what he has accomplished. So we thank you for all the hard work you do for us in broken the questions down into uh, like questions, where there were four or five folks asking the same thing. And one person said this, said this best for the three or four that asked it. It's from Mike Moriarty from Old Holyoke Development Corp. Mm -hmm. Mr. Secretary, do you have any estimates of a date when the Willamancy Bridge will reopen the traffic? And can you speak to how the delay is being resolved? Sure. And the impact this delay is having on the affected neighborhoods of Holyoke and Chicopee. Yeah, and I mean, certain, well, let's be clear. I mean, a delay in a project is never good for anybody. And so that stinks for the neighborhoods, clearly. Uh, I think folks know why we're delayed. Um, and that is because the construction company uh, went bankrupt, uh, which is rare, but it has happened at this instance. Um, now, I'll put my lawyer hat on for a minute. Don't hold that against me. I actually am a lawyer. I don't practice anymore, thank God. Um, but uh, we have a bond uh, with a company so that we can call upon that bond uh, if and when, in the Alikney case, in this case it did happen, uh, the company just walks off the job or goes bankrupt. The bond is with AIG. So we've been talking with AIG to get a new contractor on board that they will pay for, not you, not us, not the taxpayer. I expect that we will be back to work this spring, in early spring. My hope is that the bridge will be open by the end of the year, but I can't promise that. We need to continue to work with the bonding company and this contractor, but I can tell you that we have a deep sense of urgency about this project. My District 2 team has a deep sense of urgency about this project because they live with you. They're in the community. Uh, this is not just some project that's way out and it's just not on our radar. So um, I am disappointed as much as the folks who use that bridge or don't, as the case may be, every day. Um, 
but I can tell you it is absolutely at the top of our radar and we're pushing hard to get the thing, to get the thing done. Several folks asked this next question, and this was uh, somebody else could clap too. That's okay. <laughs> Good job. That was, the, uh, that was me. What, what's the status of the Commonwealth Pilot uh, IRAP? Have all nine initial projects been successfully completed, and have the grants, two point eight five million dollars, which was listed here, yes, uh, been awarded? Do you know what an IRAP is? I, I, I'll oh, I'll tell me. To you. You're the expert. You can explain it to the. Uh, so the IRAP is the Industrial Rail Access Program. It's a program we started last year, again at the encouragement of the legislature and the governor, to use um, state funds uh, that would allow private sector uh, investment. It's basically a 50-50 match. If the private sector comes to us with some money, we would match it uh, to improve small rail projects uh, around the state. Uh, there were nine that were funded. Um, we needed to get out some regulations, which is why we've held back on ultimately putting the dollars out. Um, they will go out or they have gone out already. I think I've signed contracts on those just in the last couple of weeks. And it's been so successful, I expect that we will do another round of those grants uh, this year. We've, uh, I, and I don't mind stealing good ideas. We're, we were not the first to invent this uh, thought. Uh, I think Virginia uh, has done this, Pennsylvania as well. And it's just a nice way to bring private sector and public sector dollars to bear, which again creates jobs and economic opportunity. This is literally investing in rail sidings to some extent uh, for companies that are serviced by rail cars or uh, by rail service, for example. Um, and we've been able to do it all across uh, the state. I mean, I think in many ways rail back to the future. It's the, it's the cheapest and greenest way to move products around our state. Uh, we've made a significant investment, I think you all know, in freight rail. We're working very closely with our partners at Pan Am, in the province of Worcester Railroad, CSX, uh, Norfolk Southern, uh, our, our, our four largest, but there are some smaller railroads here in the state as well, 13 as a matter of fact. So the program's been very successful. The money's going out. We're going to do it again. Great. This next question I've tried to put into a couple of uh, segments because it was a popular question asked in a variety of different ways. So I'll break it into parts. Given the probability of an MGM casino in downtown Springfield becoming a reality and construction probably occurring during the 91 Viaduct project, yeah. what dialogue is ongoing with MGM, if any already, about construction and traffic impact on sure. Springfield and surrounding communities? No, it's a great question. And so uh, I should first say that I think everyone knows we are agnostic in the administration about whether and who uh, wins a casino license. With that said, uh, it is the only license uh, application active, obviously, in this region. It seems likely that that's going to go that way. We have had conversations uh, with all uh, of the casino proponents over the last several months to talk about not our ongoing construction projects, but just first and foremost, what they would need to do in order to ensure that they're mitigating the traffic impacts for communities both surrounding and otherwise. Um, there are various ENF processes, environmental notification processes that we've been commenting on in the eastern part of the state, the southeast, and, and here as well. Um, if and when a license is awarded, which seems to be likely happening by April or May, our construction project for the I-91 viaduct is not going to begin until the end of this calendar year. We will have very deep and thoughtful discussions with folks about what those in traffic impacts are. Because at the end of the day, MGM, if in fact they're awarded a contract, does not want me preventing their customers uh, from getting to uh, the destination. So we're very cognizant of that. We've had similar conversations, in fact, with uh, a few others, as I said, on the eastern side as well. We've gotten pretty good, though, unfortunately, um, at understanding traffic mitigation and traffic patterns because there's been so much work we've been doing across the state. When it's planned, um, we've done a pretty good job. We shut down I-93 two summers ago. We've got the Callahan Tunnel shut down right now around the airport. So we have very good traffic engineers that can work and look at. Uh, we've got the, uh, Route 79 shut down at Fall River right now. So, uh, but again, it takes a lot of coordination, planning, and frankly, not focus you know, back 100 miles east from here, but having people on the ground, in the area, completely focused on traffic mitigation. You have my commitment that will happen. The, uh, this one is intriguing because earlier today I heard a conversation between engineers from Camp Dresser uh, McGee Smith and Ed Collins, who's a major labor, international uh, labor organizer uh, and a candidate for state representative, uh, about construction laydown area, i.e., while MGM is ongoing and the mm -hmm. viaduct, 
would you be needing to find places mm. for the construction work to launch from? That's the question here being concerned about, will there be enough space? Sure. To do that? Or, and this will be perhaps of interest to the mayor of West Springfield, do you need to cross the Connecticut <laughs> River perhaps and find spots for, for construction? Do we need the least land from the mayor of uh, West okay. Springfield? Um, no, I mean, obviously, whatever impacts uh, that it, either equipment or materials will have, uh, we will work with the uh, the communities for sure. And off the top of my head, we're absolutely going to need some some lay down, but I'm not sure it's it's a whole lot. Um, it's not as if we're going to be taking the massive structure down and then and putting it up in kind. This is going to be a piece uh, by piece um, approach. You know, this is a major artery. We can't have it too impacted. So uh, we're going to have to be, um, uh, I guess, choreographed in, a, in in with respect to construction. In terms of lay down, I'm sure we're going to need some space. I don't have the details of where that's going to be. Uh, but we'll work with Springfield or West Springfield or whomever. In terms of MGM's lay down, I just assume they're going to, you know, helicopter in a building and put it there, right? <laughs> they have a lot of money. So, no, I, 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 that I don't know, and I, I don't know what their plans are. But, again, if and when it's awarded, uh, we will certainly be, uh, have conversations with them about what that uh, means. We've also, we've also had conversations, it might be a question, uh, with Harry Spence. The administrator and I met uh, with Harry just about two weeks ago on the potential impacts on the court. We feel uh, that there should be no construction impacts on the court, and we'll keep a close working relationship uh, with the court as well uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen. That's great. You're answering a lot of the questions right as you go along, and a lot of the questions we have were actually answered in your initial uh, presentation to us. So maybe just one last piece on, on the MGM part. Is it possible that secretar as secretary you can suggest improvements for the South End Bridge and the Long, Men Long Meadow Interchange uh, that these could be possible improvements that you could suggest to MGM, getting them to pay for some of that. Is that possible? Does uh, mass gaming law allow for that? So it, it doesn't really allow for that in that respect. I, but we are able to comment, as we always do with major construction projects, through the environmental permitting process. And that, um, you know, there may be suggestions that are made, or we at, may ask them to study alternatives. But at the end of the day, respectfully, what we're worried about is the outcome. And that is the traffic outcome. So um, that is probably what we'll be more focused on. I know on the Long Meadow um, um, Rotary, for example, I think I was there about a month and a half ago. Um, this is the seven intersection. This was on Ripley's Believe It or Not. By the way, <laughs> I found it humorous that in my briefing materials that this rotary was in the Ripley's Believe It or Not. I'm like, there is no way that a rotary was in Ripley's Bleed, and I show up, yeah, there is a way. Yes. This rotary <laughs> was absolutely on Ripley's Bleed. Right. So I have a commitment to uh, Senator Candaris um, and others that regardless of what happens to the casino, that we are putting in money to fund yet another study. But I also think the community really needs to kind of bear down, because there are some, um, I, I would say, some controversial um, ways to mitigate that, including takings and some other things. And we're not going to do that. I think we would want to work with the community to figure out what the best way to do that is, but that intersection is about the, is this still on TV? The craziest damn thing I have seen as secretary in this state. It's really, we need to, we, there's a better way. We need to work with the town to get it done. You know, I tweeted about your comments on that. Did you, you put there, damn? And oh. I was shocked. I got like 1,200 tweeter responses. It's true. And it was astonishing. No, it's so true. people know what you're talking about. I appreciate it. I love this next question. It's from this table. I won't say from home, but I love this question. <laughs> Why not a toll Joe. on I-91 <laughs> I to capture northbound skiers from Connecticut and New York? Only those. Uh -huh. only those, yes, and only those folks. Yeah. Well, that's. Uh, so I think that's. Uh, so I remember yeah. constitutional law. I think that might be unconstitutional. Um, so a couple things. I mean, one is that um, that we are not allowed uh, to toll um, any other roads in the state, uh, uh, interstate roads, if you will, uh, that we use with federal money. So I ninety one, I ninety three, I ninety five, one twenty eight. We can't do that without federal permission. I could toll any state road tomorrow if I chose without um, federal or legislative approval for that matter. Of course, that's probably going to get a bill now that's going to get passed. But that would be crazy to do anyways, because if you toll things, you have to think about what the intended or unintended consequences are. Where will people go then if they want to avoid the toll? So you have to be careful generally. We gave a report to the legislature. They asked us this past year to give them a toll report, which we filed on December uh, 31st, about what possibilities could be and what revenues could be raised. I think that if you're thinking about the future, folks, this is a general comment about how we fund transportation in the future. The gas tax in Massachusetts, gas consumption in the state has largely been flat the last 10 years. It will go down, there is no doubt. If you're a betting man, don't go to MGM, but bet on this. 
or go to MG, I'm not um, the gas consumption is going to decline in this state five to ten years from now because fuel efficiency standards are going to be so much better. Uh, it is just a natural course of business. And so tolling or something else has to make up for that. Again, this is five or ten years from now. Um, I think, you know, if you were, we were to toll something like 91, then we would need, I would humbly recommend, more flexibility in how you use that revenue, that you can keep it on the road or within a certain segment of the road. Um, you know, the I-91 viaduct is a perfect road project that we could have used toll revenue from the turnpike to pay for if we had that permission. We don't currently have that permission. That money must stay on the turnpike. Um, the Tobin Bridge, however, no, actually that uh, is a little more creative and that could be used for other projects that help the communities in the North Shore if they wished. But I think it, it's not a conversation that will end today, but it's certainly one I hope you start thinking about, which is there's no doubt that gas consumption in the state will decline, which is good news, but we have to think more strategically about how we fund our transportation assets uh, in the medium term and the gas tax can't be the long-term solution. Tolling could be. We would need federal approval to toll I-91. And just as a final note, I believe, as I recall from my constitutional law days, uh, that it is unconstitutional to charge folks from outside the state something different than what you're charging people <laughs> inside the state for purposes of using that road. So unfortunately, as much as I wouldn't mind whacking, you know, a couple people from outside of Massachusetts. Uh, the Supreme Court might have something to say about that. I can see Wagner and Hummelson coming up with like a Shays Rebellion. Oh, class. absolutely. It's, yeah, yeah. it's Western Mass. Absolutely. After all, so. Absolutely. Uh -huh. the, uh, what is the status at the purchase of the, of, I'm sorry, what is the status of the purchase of the Connecticut River line from Pan Am Railways by the Commonwealth? What issues are keeping this sale from concluding? So, um, you know, negotiating the sale of a railroad uh, is not as uh, easy as one would like, uh, but the issues are fairly narrowed. Um, they usually center on liability and who's going to be responsible for what if there's a catastrophic accident. Um, and that's been a challenge across the United States. That's just not in Massachusetts. And that's why you see a lot of um, reluctance from some freight railroads in places like California and Florida and New York uh, because there's this split. You know, the freight's perspective, and, and if I were the freight CEO, I'd probably have this too. You know, we move inanimate objects. We move paper, we move chemicals, we move bread. In passenger rail, we move people. And if there's an accident, God forbid, uh, there is significant liability attached, potentially significant liability attached to that. I think we're working through that, though. And then what another the piece that has uh, made the uh, transaction a little more complex is that Pan Am last year entered into a strategic partnership with Norfolk Southern, which is a huge class one railroad based in Virginia, uh, which is I think good for Massachusetts, by the way, because that actually now introduces two big railroads, CSX and Norfolk Southern. So they've got to go through some corporate checks with their partner as well. Bottom line is we're going to get it done. I talked to David Fink, who's the CEO, just last week. Um, we have a couple more issues to work out. We're going to buy the line. It'll be done well before this administration leaves office. And you're going to start to see a significant amount of work this spring. And I will be darned if we don't have that railroad moving by December 31st. So that is our goal. I think we have time for one or two more questions sure, here. Sure, please. Right. So what integrated efforts are underway or planned for cities and towns off the line to ac access the rail system, hmm. whether it be via PDTA or That's any other coordinated effort? That is a great question. Um, and I don't have a good answer for it uh, because I'm not sure. But PVTA and uh, Franklin Regional Transit Authority should absolutely be part of that discussion. Obviously, we're start stopping um, our proposed rail station in Greenfield is right next to this, you know, the beautiful new FRTA building we opened uh, last year, the John Olver building, by the way. You haven't seen it. It's gorgeous. Um, and that's key. And obviously, Union Station, I mean, we're investing there. We hope Union Station will become... Uh, a transit hub, not just for rail, as I teased, but PVTA and also inner city rail. And I think Peter Picnelli and others, for example, at Pan Am are interested in going there. That would be key. Um, but we need to work with them closely. Obviously, um, the RTAs uh, uh, got some additional resources to improve service in this last uh, bill that was uh, enacted. So there's some opportunity there. But our partners, um, Mary and, and uh, Tina in particular, Tina Quate, mm -hmm. who runs uh, the Franklin Regional Transit Authority, are both quite good. I expect that we'll be coordinating service, uh, like we do with the other RTAs who service the commuter rail in the central and eastern part of the state. Are you making any provisions at all in the event that the next governor 
uh, may have some secretarial changes, cabinet changes. How does a uh, transfer of your role uh, occur if you are not secretary? Of, I'm sorry for this question. <laughs> secretary of Transportation <laughs> under a next governor, a next uh, yes. gubernatorial administration. I think we have an arm wrestling match, don't we? <laughs> Two out of three. And uh, no, I mean, I, I look. I transitions happen. This is my first. Um, I guess my first rodeo, as they say, in, in state government. I've been in state government four years, so I fully expect that, um, like my boss, I'll be transitioning out uh, in January, if not before. So uh, first of all, it's having a good team in place, and I have a phenomenal team at the department. Uh, you know, you mentioned Al Stegman earlier, who runs District 2. He's not going anywhere. Um, my district highway director, he's not going. He's in Florida right now, by the way. <sighs> <laughs> I hope it's snowing in Florida. No, I'm, I'm totally kidding. He deserves a vacation. Um, I have a terrific team across the state. So as I like to say, I'm a bit of a figurehead at this point. <laughs> I don't plow anything. I don't drive anything. I've got one of the best jobs in the state because I have a lot of people who work very, very hard. So when you're tempted, you're, I, I have one more commercial. When you're tempted to read occasionally about that state employee who may have done something wrong, please remember the thousands of people, the thousands who are up you know, now, or the next snowstorm at two in the morning, sometimes I'm one of them, talking about how we're gonna get you to wherever you're going safely in the morning. Um, I can tell you that there are a lot of people who care about you uh, that go very nameless in state government. So um, we got a lot of good people in state government and uh, I happen to run it right now. As I say, secretaries come and go, but the trains and buses always run. Very good. Hey, Tony? Yes, May I take Mr. Chairman. One, one run at that? Um, I've served with at least 10 secretaries of transportation. In the last week. <laughs> I counted them up on my way over in my head. I, I, I got 10, but it could be 11 or 12. I'll have to compare notes. Now, I've been in the legislature almost 23 years, but Rich has been there, he just said, four years. And I think in my time in the legislature, he is perhaps the longest serving secretary at four years. I can tell you that he's the fourth secretary under this governor. Uh, and so they have had transitions within administrations, never mind with a change of administrations. But I do think uh, that the job he's done in four years, there's a reason he's been there four years, he's been up to the challenges and up to the task. That's because I keep submitting my resignation, he keeps saying no, you gotta stay. <laughs> <laughs> so I do think that, that whoever would come in with the new administration, and it's likely that someone new would come in, more because he would want to leave than that anybody would want him to leave, this, this secretary. Um, Looking at it prospectively, they're going to be well positioned given what, what this gentleman's done. So, thank you, you know, Joe. He deserves really, if, before he leaves, some round of applause and appreciation from, uh, from all of you for the job he's done, not just for his remarks here today and what he'll continue to do. That is grand. And I think I'm thank you.